Hello everybody, thank you for coming. My name is Bronimir. For those of you who know me, I'm sorry that you do, but for those of you who don't, uh, I've been with the company for about 16 years or so and have been involved with uh, Scarly Publishing uh, in various aspects. And I'd like to talk a bit about that today. And so, yep, let's get started. And to answer like the first thing, uh, what is actually peer review? And as it says over there, peer review is the evaluation of work by one or more people with similar competences as the producers of the work. Uh, it functions as a form of uh, self-check, self-regulation by qualified members of the profession. But if we want to just uh, put it in layman's terms, uh, you know how when you're trying to do something and you have your dad or a friend, and we all have that one friend that steps above your head and then keeps telling you how you should do things and that you're not doing it right and they're just telling you no 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 you should have done that this way so that's a reviewer that's review and they will criticize your work and the point in science at least is that they are competent to criticize your work the example i just made is the opposite of that usually the person who is criticizing you is not competent so it was just an intro into how this should work but as it says here uh Peer review involves three stages. First stage is the desk evaluation stage, and uh, that involves just physical checks of a scientific paper. So when a paper comes in and authors have worked very hard on it, they put their time, they put their sweat, they put their money, well, usually grant money, but we'll get to that. Uh, they put in, uh, it into the paper and then they submit it to a reputable journal. Uh, the journal then checks that at the desk stage or the checklist or whatever you want to call it, where somebody from the editorial office tries and checks to see if uh, the paper is formatted correctly and they don't go really into the actual matter of the paper. But the next stage called the blind review or well to be more exact now it's called the anonymized review because using the term blind is considered culturally insensitive so uh, we are using anonymous review but for like 300 years now it has been called blind review and for much of the scientific community, they still refer it to uh, as blind review. And blind review involves just that. Uh, people who are competent checking a paper and then telling you whether it's good or if it's not good. And you don't know who they are and they don't know who you are. And that's the very basis of blind review. So the anonymity. Uh, that is supposed to provide some level of, uh, let's put it non-bias, let's put it that way. And finally, there's the revisions, if you're lucky enough, if you pass through all of this and people and the reviewers say, okay, that's not too bad, but here are things that you need to take care of. Then you get to the revision stage and they tell you what you need to fix. But to provide a bit of a historical perspective on this, I want to go to the ancient times and the birth of science itself. And uh, as it says here, so no scientific journals, no systemic peer review, and the equivalent of peer review was Socrates going around town and asking people questions. And that was pretty much it. So whenever somebody came up with an invention, uh, they, uh, if they didn't write it down, it was just lost to history. And that has happened countless times, which we've learned later by fi finding some examples, like the Antikythera machine that was found uh, near the waters of Antikythera Island uh, near in, well, today's Greece which was uh, practically a simple planetarium which could predict the positions of planets and dates. And it was very advanced for its age. I mean, it was a machine like with cogs and everything, but the method of how it was built and what it was used for was completely lost to history because nobody made any accounts of it, nobody reviewed it, and nobody wrote anything about it. So uh, the problem also with that was uh, that uh, in ancient times, whatever you wrote down became a dogma. And there's no better example of that than Aristotle. So uh, Aristotle was the student of Plato, Plato being the student of Socrates, and whatever Aristotle wrote down became the law for about 1500 years. So right up, up until the Renaissance, everything that Aristotle wrote down was considered law and dogma by the Catholic Church, and by that extent, the Western world. And that stifled a lot of inventions and progress in, uh, in science because the ancients knew best. You don't question anything the ancients, ancients said. So we know everything already. And it was not until 1665 and the Royal Society of London that we got the first scientific journal ever. 
I mean, there were inventions before that, of course, during the Renaissance especially, but it all revolved about people writing to each other in a very, very small and knit community uh, where they exchanged information and nobody from the outside world was aware of their inventions. So there was no dissemination of knowledge. Nobody knew where we were going with this. And maybe there was somebody in Sweden working on something similar that somebody in Italy was working on, but they had no way of knowing what was going on and no way of comparing notes because they didn't know each other. This particular journal, the Philosophical Transactions, is the first scientific journal ever and it's also the longest published journal in history. It's still published and it's actually one of the journals that we support on the Scholar One Manuscripts platform. Uh, the Royal Society is one of my clients and I work with them on a daily basis and they're very proud of the fact that they are owners of the oldest scientific journal in history and by proxy we are connected to one of the pillars of science of modern science as it exists so i find that very cool but yeah not a lot of people agree with me but it's cool so uh and as it says here there was no peer review initially and uh, the editor was god so being appointed as the editor of a scientific journal took a lot of prestige and not it was not uncommon that political influence was also involved so when you took hold of it you never let go and when somebody sent you a paper, you would review it, you would check it, and if you liked it, you would publish it. If you didn't, well, tough luck. And the problem there is, as you can see, editors are human beings. They are biased, and there might be somebody that they don't like, even though uh, what they found was sound and made sense. Uh, if they didn't like the guy, they would just say, oh yeah, you can try publishing that someplace else. Oh, sorry, there are no other journals. Well, you're not going to publish it anywhere. And uh, the next thing that actually happened was the French Academy of Sciences, which was published only three years before uh, by Louis XIV. Uh, and uh, in 1669, they conducted a uh, first report evaluating inventions and practically science. Oh, why is this not moving? Sorry. Uh, uh, in the report checking inventions and science uh, discoveries for King Louis XIV, and that was the first instance of anything systematic, uh, resembling systematic peer review, where items were checked, proofed, and then uh, the examples provided to uh, the general public, well, the general public being King Louis XIV, uh, who was a really, really insane person, and one day I'm going to tell you how uh, the cravat got its name, uh, and it was him being eight years old, well, I'm gonna tell it now anyway, because I find it funny. Uh, you can cut that from this. Uh, because uh, they were taking Croatian mercenaries at the time, and they were uh, in London when Louis XIV was just eight years old, they were fighting on the French side during the uh, succession war with the Austro-Hungarians. And uh, the Croatian mercenaries uh, came around carrying scarves around their necks, which were supposed to hold their uh, jackets. So it was not a fashion statement, it was just the way it looked. But it came, it came very interesting to one particular eight-year-old, Louis XIV, who find it very funny that they were wearing that, and he started wearing it, and voila, it became practically a thing of fashion. Everybody wanted to wear it, but they didn't know what to call it. And because uh, the name for Croatians in Croat is Hrvat and uh, in French it's Croat. Uh, the little eight-year-old boy came in with the word Kravat. And that's how we have Kravata today. Which is completely unrelated to peer review, but I just find it funny. So <laughs> I'm gonna move on to the next one, and it will be the Royal uh, What do I need to do? This? No. Sorry, I messed something up. Current slide. Current slide. Resume slideshow. Ah, there we go. So, the Royal Society of Edinburgh, and that's the editorial office there. So, uh, they appointed a group of select members to vet material submitted to them. And so, this was the first editorial office. I'm not kidding, that's the editorial office. That's William Wallace. Uh, and they actually checked stuff for publication. Uh, and I think this is a good place to actually talk about the uh, types of blinding in peer review. So traditional peer review is usually either single blind or double blind, or as we call it today, single anonymized or double anonymized. Meaning that uh, single blind is the most common thing and it's present on like 60 or 70% of scientific journals. And it means that the reviewers uh, 
uh, the authors don't know who the reviewers are, but the authors, uh, but the reviewers do know who the author is, and this is considered uh, to be more biased than double blind, which was then established for one time as a standard. But as time went by, and especially given uh, the metadata in most of the files that the authors supply, which couldn't be stripped at all times, it was pretty easy to figure out who the author was, and. Uh, that way, uh, who the reviewers were and who the author was. So that way, that kind of killed the point of double blinding. And most of journals are single blind now. Double blind involved the authors and the reviewers being oblivious of one another's identity and just conducting unbiased review based on the material that was present to them. Which sounds all nice and dandy in, uh, when you say it, but in practice, it doesn't always work. Not just for the reasons I mentioned, but for some others. And uh, yeah, so a survey uh, of editors and chief editors and editorial boards of some 590 chemistry journals found that 97% of the journals didn't offer double blind peer review and they considered it completely unnecessary. But I do have to mention one, uh, one interesting uh, aspect of uh, well, scholarly history. Uh, when uh, the scientists who discovered the DNA double helix in 57 submitted their paper to the journal of uh, and that was it? No, uh, it was biology, or it doesn't matter what the name of the journal was. But when they submitted it, the paper didn't go for review at all, because there was nobody who could review it. Uh, and the explanation given by the editorial office for accepting that paper was, uh, okay, this thing is self-evident, and there hasn't been a person in the community who has stopped talking about this since they heard about it. So it was that influential, and it was that groundbreaking that there was nobody qualified to review it. It was just so new. Uh, but those examples are rare, and in most cases, papers, like 99.9% .9 of the papers submitted uh, get rejected. And yeah, well, we come there to that famous saying by uh, Theodore Strungen, one of the iconic science fiction writers, who said, 95% of science fiction is garbage, but so is 95% of everything else. And science does not really uh, stand apart from that, uh, from that statement. So, uh, yeah, and in 1831, we started uh, having uh, baseline focuses for reviews, which meant that uh, we now had a focus on what is actually relevant in a review. Because up until then, you could just say things like this, like, and this is an actual quote from a review. So, the findings are not novel and the solution induces despair. And I've actually seen much, much worse. And in some examples, uh, especially in scholarly manuscripts, but also on other platforms, you're able to provide, reviewers are able to provide comments to the author, which the author is going to see, and comments to the editor-in-chief, which the author cannot see. And those things are gold. Like, there's so many, uh, <laughs> so many good examples of people criticizing other uh, authors on their novelty and they're sometimes even good stuff, but usually they're just killing them off. Like there is a comment by a reviewer made on a very, on a manuscript that had like 70 or something authors. And the only comment by the reviewer was kill this quickly before it grows. Uh, review reports became anonymous back in 1831. So what I was referring to as single blind and the reviewer became the defender of the publication's prestige and reputation. Now, uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, societies considered systematic implementation of peer review to, uh, yeah, I'm quoting here, stem the veritable flow, uh, veritable sewage thrown into the pure stream of science. That was a quote by Michael Forster, who was a physiologist at the time. And uh, peer review became commonplace in the Anglophone world. Uh, double blind became the standard then, but as I said, this is now again shifting to single blind simply because it's no longer veritable to keep the reviews hidden. And we're going to get to one point uh, also later, but I'm going to just mention it briefly here, something called transparent peer review. And this is a novel thing that just started developing maybe two years ago, and I was involved with it, where we are completely abandoning blinding as a, sim as a system and just telling everybody, okay, these are the reviewers, these are the authors, these are the comments, everything is transparent, everybody knows everything, so please behave. And you, wouldn't you know it, it didn't stop people from writing those kinds of comments that they did to the editors in chief. So now they're just writing it to the authors and they just don't care. And that's a really novel thing just to see that level of honesty in science because usually they tend to try and play nice. Oh. Where am 
right now. So now we're going to jump to uh, Eugene Garfield. Uh, that's his picture from college. Uh, and he's very important to us because he is uh, intricately related to Clarivate Analytics, the company some of us work for uh, uh, and have been working for its various iterations throughout the years. Uh, Eugene Garfield created the first scientific index of published weight literature. And that's very important because that led subsequently to the journal impact factors, the journal citation reports, and subsequently the web of science. Now, uh, this is a massive milestone and why that is I'll cover later because we're going to go into details of the web of science but just a short uh, intro journal impact factors tell you how good a scientific journal is and there are only two methods of measuring uh, there are only two standardized methods of measuring how good a journal is journal impact factor is one and scopus is the other one funnily enough both are, are owned by private companies which supposedly bring in non-bias to the whole concept because they're not f uh, funded by a publisher or government, but that opens a whole other can of worms. So, uh, but we'll get to that. The citation reports revolve about around the journal impact factor and also they're published uh, quarterly, I believe, and uh, they uh, bring in the, well, uh, the newest results for the journal impact factor and some other uh, relevant systems of measurement for how good a journal is. So, uh, going to the modern time, damn it, I'm not doing something right here, current slide, yeah, gotcha. So, going to the modern times, and modern meaning 90s, I know that's not modern anymore, but for me it is, it was 10 years ago. Uh, so, in 91, uh, Archive, uh, a preprint repository was created, and this is important because uh, the way the scientific process on scientific journal works is the authors do their best to work on a manuscript they submit the manuscript manuscript goes through peer review it gets rated it gets accepted or gets a revision or gets rejected which is what com happens most commonly and uh, after that it gets published if it's accepted but on archive anybody can go and submit anything so if you wanted to write a scientific paper with absolutely zero scientific knowledge you go for it archive will accept it people can access it and it's free to access uh, and yeah that's actually a good uh, segue into one of the bigger problems for uh, scientific papers and again something that we'll cover later but articles cost money and they cost a lot of money so each article costs around 30 40 dollars and when you are a scientist and you want to be able to check, you need references, you need to read as much papers that are relevant to your field as you can. And not every paper is going to be important for the work you're doing right now. So you need to read 100 papers or maybe 200 papers before you can make your work, uh, make, make uh, the paper that you want. And that is going to cost a lot of money. Uh, how that money comes by and why it costs a lot of money, we'll cover a bit later. Uh, in 2000, uh, Biomed Central launches and it didn't measure the potential impact during review, meaning that practical review was not important anymore. So they did have a peer review, it's just that, that they didn't take into account the novelty and the rigor, scientific rigor that was uh, provided by the reviewers. So it was more like checking on people's feelings on the manuscript. Uh, in 2006, PLOS One launched, launched and PLOS One is a very interesting thing because usually journals are related to a single topic or a simple subtopic. PLOS One is a mega journal. It covers everything. So if you're an astronomer and you have something that's related to black holes, you submit it to PLOS One. They have people and editorial offices who can check that. If you're a surgeon and you wrote a paper on cutting out appendixes or whatever, you can again submit a paper to PLOS One. They have people who are going to check that. So everything is in place there. Frontiers launched in 2007 and they tried to introduce collaborative peer review, but unfortunately Frontiers proved out to be, let's say, a predatory system. And uh, we have a segment on that a, a bit later. But in essence, uh, the collaborative peer review allowed reviewers to know about each other and practically comment on a paper like they're on a forum. So, or on Twitter or wherever. You have a paper and everybody shares information below and it's 
technically biased because they can influence one another. So the reviewers are going to read the comments of other reviewers and then make their decisions based on that, which you can argue is a good thing. I'm not so convinced, but again, new is not always better. Let's put it that way.